Alan Watt says that worry is an endlessly peeled onion. Gerard sees human desires as constituted by really two strands. Physical desire, a desire for the object itself, as well as metaphysical desire. The desire for what that object says about me. He basically says, you know, Gerard is a one-size-fits-all. Gerard's answer is that we desire to exist very loosely in great measure. We want to be cool. It's in our base code as humans to first fit in to the tribe, but then Store adds, after you fit in, what you want to do is stand out. So people are into it for its own sake, or mimetic theory has no value, and people are interested only because other people are interested in it, which is exactly what mimetic theory says. Apocalyptic pessimism is not my brand of tea. Innovation is nothing but a minimal respect of the past and a mastery of its achievements. I've always said pessimists sound smart and optimists make money. The cat is already jumping out of the box and there's no way to get it back in. Well, hello everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another Infinite Loops. One of the things I love about Infinite Loops is that I get to have people on who have a very specific and yet very deep domain knowledge about a particular subject that I am interested in. And that subject today is the philosophy of René Girard, mimetic theory. My friend, Jonathan B., who has done a series of lectures, spoiler alert, I got to watch some of them and you can't. Actually, you can. We're going to talk about that. Jonathan, welcome. Thanks for having me. Before we begin, I thoroughly enjoyed our first lecture. You recited a poem that I liked so much that I've been reciting it. So I think it was, well, let, me, let me try here. Fill the South Sea goblet full. The gods to our stock give care. Europa please accepts the bowl. Joe with joy puts away the bear. I love Bingo. that. Bingo. There Fantastic. you go. Fantastic. <laughs> well, I think we are post people writing poetry about startups and, and huh. stocks, right? Yeah, we're out of the peak. Yeah, the cyclic nature is very interesting to me. Let's, try, let's dive right in because as I said to you before we started to record, like, the prep time for you in particular, <laughs> this is a compliment, so take it as one, is like enormous because your lectures are fascinating. So I love watching those. But then, as you know, I am a rabbit hole jumper. And so like lecture, fantastic. But then Jim has to, he can't help himself go down the rabbit hole. So we're going to, I think, come up with some interesting takes right. on what we're going to discuss today. But the title of the lecture that we're going to talk about mostly today was Prestige. And in its original Latin, as David, your conversant, points out, this is what six years of Latin got me. I know the origins of words. Was in the original Latin, it actually meant conjuring tricks, as in a magician, prestidigitation, right? In later Latin, it meant illusion. But then I love when it changes to French, it means illusion, but glamour. So if you would, please set the stage for us on the whole Girardian notion of prestige, why we seek it, et cetera, like you did in the lecture that other people haven't had a chance to see yet. Well, so I think where we need to start off is maybe just a brief reminder of what we talked about last, last podcast discussion will be very quick, is that Gerard sees human desires as constituted by really two strands. Physical desire, a desire for the object itself or what the object can bring us, the experience of the object, as well as metaphysical desire, the desire for what that object says about me. So a few examples, very quick. If I desire sex, it could be out of physical desire. That would be for intimacy or the pleasure or it could be metaphysical desire, what having sex with a certain type of person says about me, right? And this is the psychology of the Don Juan or the Coquette. When I choose a car, it could be the gas mileage for how comfortable the seat is to sit in, whether there's a massage in the seat, or it could be you know, what driving a Rolls Royce around uh, says about me. Not always positive, by the way. So when you're in uh, the next step that Gerard goes after delineating these two species of desire is how do we, what do we really desire to be? And Gerard's answer is that we desire to exist very loosely in great measure. We want to be cool, put it in very colloquial terms. But how do we know, know that? And this is where the mimetic part of it really comes in. Gerard's hypothesis is that we desire objects associated with models to people of superior being who, who we already look up to. 
jobs, right? So this could be a sports star, a celebrity, or even more mundane, just a coworker who has been doing really well in the company, or maybe in old times, it was a priest or a divine figure, or it could be even a fictional hero like Achilles. And Gerard's intuition is that we tend to take on the desires that they take on with the false assumption being that those objects which they desire are what grant them that, that addition in being. And so you can already see, if we were to design, if we were to define prestige, and I think this is a totally reasonable way to define it, as desiring the object for more than what it can bring us, right? That there's almost, even when we say today that Harvard is prestigious, it's almost a half critique because you're saying it doesn't fully warrant, the object itself doesn't fully warrant that desire. Gerard would say that's where the other part of the desire comes from, the prestige part of the desire. It comes from the associations with the superior models. So Gerard always sees the human subject as never desiring alone, but always desiring among a community of other desires. And the overlay, if you will, alpha over the object beta, if you will, to put it into financial terms, that, that is the mechanism that, of prestige that Gerard identifies. That, that is fascinating. I immediately thought of the George Box quote or maxim that all models are wrong and some are useful. And that's kind of the way I approach life. It's one of the, I got very interested in mimetic theory a long time ago before the craze, which I wonder must be mimetically driven. Right. And I remember saying it to people and they would kind of look at me and half of my respondents would say things like, well, yeah, that makes total sense. And the other half would say, oh, that's absurd. You know, I don't think like that. You know, what proof is there? And it makes me think of something that you said in the second lecture where it was, and I think you might've been paraphrasing Gerard himself, where he says, or you said, grant me this one hypothesis, right? And that was at the beginning. To me, my mind immediately went to planted axiom. And you know what a planted axiom is. Mm, uh, oh, right, okay. Yeah. So a, plant, a planted axiom in logic is the assumption or the assertion rather that a point that you are trying to make is true. It right, is asserted right. as true, even mm -hmm. though no proof is given right. as, as to its accuracy yeah. or there is no empirical proof, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You take logic, which I did, one one of the first things you learn about is the planted axiom, because they'll say this is applicable in many. It's not just logic. It's applicable across many human endeavors where someone right. basically flips one in on you and then the rest falls into place. So talk a bit about that. I mean, there there is some in, there is some interesting thing. I always like default to I wonder if evolution has anything to say on this, or at least my interpretation of yeah, it. Yeah. And, you know, we have mirror neurons and those make sense. But anyway, talk about like asking for relief with your first hypothesis seems to me to be special pleading. Yeah, well, that's quite interesting, right? Because it's almost this, you're making a Cartesian allowance for oneself of you know, just give me this one thing, whereas you know, Descartes is trying to find that one thing that, that he can lean on, so to speak. But before I go there, I want to bring up an interesting thing that, that you discussed about this about the interest in mimetic theory being a mimetic craze itself. And I think that's right. But unfortunately, I think it put its detractors in a very difficult situation. You know, there are some comments on some of the podcasts I've been making, which is like, oh, you know, people are just into mimetic theory these days because it's popular. And I'm like, but that is precisely what mimetic theory <laughs> it, it, it tells people, right? Mimetic theory does have value. Because it's right, and so people are into it for its own sake. Or mimetic theory has no value, and people are interested only because other people are interested in it, which is exactly what mimetic theory says. So, anyways, I, I, obviously there's ways to strengthen that critique. I, I was being a bit, I was jesting a bit there, but just thought I'd, you know, as a logician myself, I thought I'd also uh, highlight that sort of interesting incongruence. And to answer your question directly, so context is. David, my interlocutor in the lecture, asks me, what proof is there for mimesis? I believe, I said, you know, from a STEM background, as I was, and most intelligent people are tra trained these days, my exhortation to him was to expand the type or species of evidence that he is willing to take in. Because if it's just this sort of scientific evidence, you know, do an experiment that's all verifiable, falsifiable, then you're not going to get at most of the important truths in the world. Now, I'll tell you what kind of evidence Gerard provides us. 
But first, I think with Gerard, there are empirical, like scientific evidence for mimesis. I don't think it's super well developed, but I think it's a very fruitful path to explore. There are mirror neurons, for example, neurons that both fire when you observe an action, also when you're performing the same action. It also exists in monkeys as well. And also there's been copious amount of studies about how imitation seems to be almost a natural evolutionary intuition of mankind, where babies, when they're born just you know a few hours, they start imitating the experimenter's uh, facial expressions. But obviously, Gerard's arguments do not proceed in such a way. You know, let's do an experiment on this society. Let's see if they kill anyone. And let's say if they assign any undeserved blame. Most of Gerard's proof, and I think much, there's a great species of philosophical proof that, can, that is what I call a hermeneutical proof. And it goes something like this. Grant me this one axiom, this one planted axiom, is that right? One planted axiom, and just follow me along here and let me show you what this thing can do. And judge the validity of this axiom by the amount, this whole kaleidoscope of phenomenon that I am able to make sense to you. And, so, you know, you know, I'm reading phenomenology right now, right? Hegel, and at least he doesn't directly address why things can't be contradictory, right? Because contradiction is how the phenomenology progresses. And when I asked my professor this, he, he was like, don't be so difficult, Jonathan, just grant Hegel this one thing and see what he is able to do with this idea of non-contradiction. And then let's ask that question. So I think, and this goes into a whole nother conversation, but, but science really narrows that the species, and wrongfully so, species and type of evidence that the modern man is willing to accept. And I think that's part of why I even had to go into that, David, in the first place. But I hope that answers. The, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's interesting to me because I kind of have a love-hate relationship with Gerard. The ap apocalyptic pessimism is not my brand of tea. And yet I continue to be fascinated by the theories because... There is a lot of use from understanding mimetic behavior, et cetera. Like I, well, Wittgenstein, I think, don't look for meanings, look for use. Yeah. And, and so I keep dipping back into and watching lectures like yours, which are really great. And so on the one hand, I'm like, there is a lot of use here, right? Yeah, it helps right. you to understand in a better, more fulsome way human behavior, what drives us. It's more than adjacent to the idea of status seeking. I had Will Storer, the author of The Status Game, on, and in my mind, they kind of blend together. Right. And one of the things that, that he maintains is that it's in our base code as humans to first fit in to the tribe. Yeah, because if you don't fit into the tribe, they excommunicate you or exile you. And in the days of a hunter gatherer, you were dead, you know, basically yeah. to be exiled was to a death sentence. Yep. So it really fits with just like the whole evolution of how society evolved itself fit in. Right. So in other words, the only way to fit in is to watch what everyone else is doing, right. To mimic them and thus the mirror neurons and everything else. But then store adds, which I, also find true is after you fit in, what you want to do is stand out, <laughs> which is an interesting phenomenon to me. And it seems to be quite universal. What have you in all of your various studies, et cetera, that are not necessarily obviously adjacent to Girardian mimetic theory, but which you find yourself because of your deep domain knowledge on Girard and mimetic theory saying, oh. Right, right. Well, there's, there's so much. There's, you know, Soros is who I, I've been meaning to explore more theory of reflexivity, alchemy mm -hmm. and finance. I mean, one way to read Girard, the fascinating way is that an attack on economic thinking, as, and maybe we can go into that. There's a line of thinkers called the recognition theorists that I'm ha happy to elaborate upon. I find a deep synergy with Buddhism. In fact, how I got into Girard in the first place was I was trying to resolve some personal struggles. And I found it was the Gerard and the Buddhists who were most able to sort of speak to that. I know you're a Taoist yourself. And I actually ended up writing a 50,000 word manuscript that's been abandoned, unfortunately, about these two interfaith dialogues. And, and I hope to have connected them in quite a deep way, even though that connection is not complete. But let me make a comment, if that's okay, before I dive into any of those, about this idea of status seeking. And I would say that, you know, much like I'm a Buddhist because I'm not a physicist, 
Einstein was able to describe classical physics, but also expand the domain of it. Again, tell me if that's right. I don't know. I, that's I'll my question. Yeah. I would argue mimetic theory actually goes deeper than this sort of mere sort of status signaling while being able to explain all the interesting parts of, of this type of outlook. But let me explain first why it goes deeper. This idea of status seeking, in some sense, still models people as these individuals. Now, in individuals granted who want the approval of others, but individuals on the, on, nonetheless who are able to come up with their own, even, those, even though there's an overlay of social desires beyond them. But what Gerard is saying is that normative certainty itself, okay, so I'm using a perennial distinction here for our listeners between normative and descriptive, like descriptive, like the color of my turtleneck, the length of my hand, you know, anything they can measure, so to speak, or you can right. observe. Normatives, what is the good? What ought I do? What is the beautiful? Axiology, values. Gerard would say the strongest authority that determines normative value is other people. And the model you get no longer is individuals who merely seek the approval of others, but individuals who interpenetrate each other. That the, I am not a fully formed individual without, that the, all of my friends' desires are not just external things that I desire, but are so deep within me that make up myself. Or to put more provocatively, as Gerard would say, there is no individual. And this is a really a cataclysmic and revolutionary, a good and bad, but mostly a terrifying sense of a moral framework to build a social theory off. Of. Because what does modernity you know, think normative value derives from? I would say that there's largely two sort of answers here. One answer is reason, right? And that's the enlightenment. And that's why we have mill. That's why we have elections, right? That the individual can, through his or her own power, reason what is a good without the interference of others. The other, I would say, is romanticism. Our intuitions, right, our, our deep sense feeling. And this is crux of the LGBTQ movement, right? How does that five-year-old boy over there know that she's really a girl? Well, because she really believes, like, like she really intuits, and only she has access to that subjectivity. Well, Gerard says nay to both fronts. It's not, our intuitions can be just as influenced socially by media, by other forces, by other people. And our reason does not stand alone either. Our reason pretends in a platonic way to guide the reins of spirit and appetite, but is often spokesperson, right? We often determine our stances through tribalistic forces and reason becomes a defensive lawyer, a spokesperson. So this is a very fundamental attempt on the foundations of Western sort of political, modern political theory, but even though it may appear innocuous, because it fundamentally uh, destroys the most important, I would say, social political conception, social political ontological foundation of the modern West, which is the individual. Now, you can take this in either direction, right? It could be progressive, right? This is also a Marxist Hegelian critique, or you can take it reactionary, a sort of an Nietzschean critique, but it is fundamentally against modern philosophical political assumptions. Yeah, and that is one of the things that I both find interesting, but also just sometimes or just give a shrug to, because I kind of like the modern world. I kind of right, like right. elections and agency right. and all of those things. But I was also reading Gabriel Tard, who I'm sure you're familiar with. You'll have to enlighten me again. Okay. Well, Gabriel Tard was a predecessor to Gerard who basically came up with very similar ideas. In his book, The Laws of Imitation, which was published in 1899, well, well ahead of Girard, he makes the claim that I want to get your read on. He, he says it's basically the laws of imitation follow sort of three things, right? The first is innovation. Um, now, he maintains in the book that in true innovators in society are about 1%. And that is a fairly constant in his estimation. I don't know that I agree, but I'm just telling you what he said in yeah, back in yeah, 1890. Yeah. And that innovation, the 1% causes others who are not innovators to copy them. And thus you get trend setting, thus you get the new thing, right, all of that right. type of thing. And then he says in the book that it ultimately falls into opposition, which grows from disparate places, disparate philosophies, et cetera. 
and then rinse and repeat. And then as you continue to read him and then you see other people like Rene Palmier, are you familiar with him? Mm-hmm. Okay. So he Takes basically- you to school. <laughs> Well, like I said, rabbit holes, man. Rabbit just, holes. I, I just dive down them. And by the way, there's a lot of, the, and I'm sure you know this, there's a lot of really interesting and similar ideas expressed by Spinoza, Hobbes, yes. de Tocqueville, right, uh, right, at right, all. Right. But let's stay with Rene Palmier for a moment. And he asked three questions. And he's more specifically speaking to Girard, whereas Tard didn't know about Gerard because he was a predecessor of him. So the first one that I'd like you to think about and answer is Palmier basically says, yes, this is a fascinating theory. However, how does he explain taboo desires? You mentioned the various sexuality groups that are now emergent. Yeah. And his specific question, though, goes to probably pre-internet, pre-ability yeah, for, yeah. for us to see socially. How does it, how does he describe, so for a pre-social media gay kid, for example, with very conservative parents, right. and yet he still has that desire and implicit, at least my read of Pamir is he's implying yeah. there, there isn't any mediator that he right. is modeling himself on. Second thing he says is every potential situation has dozens, many times more mediators. Yeah. And it is up to the individual who you just asserted under right. Girardian theory doesn't exist to use his agency to choose a mediator. Yeah. And yes. then the, and, and then the final one is, which we've already hit on kind of a kind of catty, honestly, from, and this isn't me, I'm just, I'm quoting here. Right. He basically says, you know, Gerard is a one size fits all. Oh, yeah. And, he's a hedgehog. And, he's a hedgehog. Yeah, he's a hedgehog. So what do you think? I know I dropped a lot on you there. Oh, yeah, but yeah, no, no, this sharp. is fascinating. This is fascinating. A few things. The first thing I'll say is I don't want to paint Gerard as a political radical in either hyper-progressive or hyper-reactionary, although I think he does have both instincts. He himself, I think, better described as apolitical. He thinks it's right. pointless in some sense yeah. in this sort of end times to engage in politics. But when you really press him, and also, let me be clear, when I say that his intuitions of normativity are reactionary, progressive against modern Western philosophical assumptions, that's not to say he himself was against those, because those intuitions naturally lend towards progressivism or reactionary movements. But there's also a way to smuggle that in into the good old liberal democracy. And that is what Gerard himself does. When you read some of his lesser read works, like When These Things Begin, great book, in fact, it's the first one that I recommend when they want like a really easy to understand Gerard, because it's a conversation and People are throwing modern topics at him, like victimhood or climate change. And he basically says, yeah, the, you know, the liberal democracies are built on, in some sense, a lot, the individual. But nonetheless, it, that's still the best thing that we have to correct our sort of fundamentally sort of social tendencies. So one can still very much rescue liberal democracies, the first thing I'll say in response to that. The second thing, and I'm just going to briefly touch upon this, maybe we'll remember it and we'll open up this Pandora's box later, but I've been asked to give a, a, a lecture on the philosophy and history of innovation at University of Austin. So I've been preparing in my free time for that. So there's a lot we could go into on this idea of innovation and how that it connects to imitation. But the long story short there, as, as the one hit wonder, Gerard, as you probably can guess, he thinks that innovation and imitation are actually connected in some deep and intimate way. But I'll put that as a teaser out there because I want to get to your most meaty, hardest to hit fastball questions. The first question was, about, it wasn't the taboo designer. That was the second question. What was the first question? That was again? the second. The, se the first one was simply an observation that Gabriel Tard yeah. in 1890 wrote a book called The Laws of Imitation. In oh, which. Right, right, right. Yeah. In which he did a three-step process right, that, right, right. with rinse to repeat. It begins with innovation, which he maintains is a tiny percentage of the population. Right, One percent right, right. is what he says. I don't agree, but that's what he says. He says that then the majority in the population or society imitates, right, that innovation. And then that breaks down into opposition to the previously innovative yeah, discovery. Yeah, I see, I see. And so the reason I brought him up was simply because I assumed that and perhaps incorrectly, that Gerard had probably read 
Right. Yeah. Well, well, Gerardo actually trace a long lineage of people who talk about imitation, including, of course, you know, Plato and Aristotle. Of course. Gerard has his own defense of what he thinks is unique about what he adds. And he thinks everyone has been talking about imitation of things that aren't desire. And he specifically focused on mimetic desire, acquisitive mimesis. I don't know how much I buy that, having read the other authors, but that's his own self-conception. But let me address this innovation because it's a very fascinating one. And I think it's a real big question, right? If Gerard thinks that the world is governed by a logic of imitation, how does innovation happen? And this is his Gerard's line. I've lo I loved it so much. It's the best one-liner on the concept of innovation that I remember to heart. Innovation is nothing but a minimal respect of the past and a mastery of its achievements. And I think we're going to have to unpack this a little bit because I think what Gerard is doing is warning against two types of ideas that are contra to innovation. He is, in summary, as a preview, trying to sail between the silo of idolatry and the charybdis of fashion. So let's talk about the first one. Clearly, one view that is antithetical and destructive, and this is quite obvious because we know this it's in our minds, against innovation is this idea that history has happened already, that our best times are past, and the best thing we can do is to imitate the past. This has been attributed to certain Christian thinkers in the Reformation, for example. Re the innovation had a really bad word. Innovation was synonymous with heresy. When the, in the 200 years plus Reformation, because the Catholics were like the Protestants, they're innovators. And you get these funny pamphlets that are almost nonsensical to us, where like the king against the innovators or something like that, because we think innovation is a great thing. And what's really funny is that the Protestants then said, no, F, you're the innovators. The Catholics, you're the real innovators. You've added upon this religious form on top of the true Christian message. Okay. So you, you see this intuition, right? That, that what is good is that going back to an origin, right? The, the Garden of Eve or, or Christ's message that we've been expelled from. And this, I think, has been probably the, the dominant, if not the most common intuition of history that we've had throughout human history, right? The Confucians. What does Confucius teach us? Restore the rituals of the Joe, right? It's a looking back. So that, that is clearly one sort of way to pervert from innovation, okay? And that's why he says minimal respect of past. Okay, so that, that's one side. We don't want to do that. The other side, and this is where it gets really interesting and relevant to modernity, is what he calls fashion. That is to say, a disrespect of past. That, you also can't have that. You can't just desire the new, the novel for the novel. Because imitation, replication, mastery, is a necessary precondition. Think about Goethe, who mastered the classical poetic forms before he pioneered his own. Think about each successive industrial power that was always wrongfully recognized only as a copycat. This happened with the English, I believe, with the Germans, or it might have been the other way around. And then it happened with America. You look at what the continent said about America in the, 20, in the early 20th, 19th century. They were like, oh, the Americans can't take on a world leadership position. Those are just pale, industrious imitators, right? And the same thing happened with Japan and Korea and China. And so Gerard's point is that, you know, person who's being copied is so scared and shocked when imitators rise to become innovators in their own right, because they've drawn a false, a false dichotomy between these two concepts. In fact, what you need to do to truly innovate is pure mastery. Master everything that has come before you but don't idolize it. Don't think that is the end all be all. And let me give you two examples. You know, we tend to think, you know, Jack Ma, Alibaba, copying eBay, copycat, and Einstein, all oh, general relativity, you know, something completely new. But I would wager that then the form of that activity is quite similar, right? Whereas Jack Ma had to understand exactly how e-commerce was, was being implemented in the West, not be idolatrous to that, and figure out how to adapt his understanding to a new market. Einstein also had to study classical physics for, you know, the good first parts of his life. And, you know, if I were to put it in one line, I'd say something like, you know, no imitation can be done without some innovation because it needs to be adapted, to be adopted. And so Gerard actually sees, this is the last comment I'll make, in, in, in modernity, where innovation has become so proliferated. He actually thinks that right now is the pull that we've swung to. The reason we're not making big innovations and breakthroughs isn't because we're idolatrous to the past. 
but because we've actually devalued it too much. We've swung too much to the other side of liking novelty for novelty's sake. In the same way, Confucian and Chinese antiquity might have sired a tradition for its own sake. The sort of movie version of this that always gets me is Marlon Brando, Wild Ones, I think a movie in the 50s where he plays this really cool, rebellious, I think a motorbike gang leader. He's in a bar. A cute girl goes up and asks him, what are you rebelling against? And he, sm he smiles with a smug grin. And he says, what do you got? He doesn't give a damn what you're going to give him. He doesn't really stand for anything other than the you know, antiquarian stands for anything other than love of the past. And so Gerard actually thinks that in modernity, industry, business is actually much more innovative than the arts, the humanities, because business leaders are more happy to copy. Whereas people in the arts and the humanities and philosophy, they all want to do something original. And that's the fundamental reason they're not doing anything original. I'll pause there. That, that, that's, a, a, yeah. a interesting. Several threads there. First on the Confucian quote, I immediately thought of the Lao Tzu verse where he goes through his reasoning where natural goodness is a loss. I'm, bo I'm bollocksing this up. But it's something along the lines of where natural goodness is lost, art, artifice and ritual replace it. And I'll find the verse and I'll text it to you or email it to you because that's immediately what I think of. I think of Lao Tzu answering Confucius there with saying, no, buddy, you, the rituals that you are so desirous of, that's a sign of stasis and decay. That is not a sign of a healthy health, society. Right. And then to the other I would say I would go all Deutschian on you, David Deutsch, the beginning of infinity. And one of his wonderful observations in his book was what were physicists saying about a nuclear power and the internet in 1900? Uh, nothing because they didn't exist. Nobody knew about them. And Deutsch presses the point to the point of like he repeats it so often that you get a little irritated, but you also understand why he's pressing the point. And the point is one of the, one of the blind spots we as humans have is that we lack the understanding that we have no way to prognosticate or prophesize future knowledge. And thus his example of physicists in 1900 not knowing anything or having any opinion on the internet or nuclear power yeah, yeah. because we lack the ability to prophesize what new innovations, back to innovations, and new knowledge will occur. So that leads often to, you'll see societies in stasis. And then my final thing is a question again to you, which is, you know, did Gerard like miss inflection points? And by that, I mean, I was thinking about, you bring up Plato. I, like you, have had my Plato period and my Aristotle period. And I love uh, play, play Plato's example of the reason and emotion, the two horses, the chariot yeah, yeah. with the two horses. And we always update our metaphors and analogies to whatever is current. So now we right, talk about right, computers right. and- Before it was watches and, 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 and steamboats well, for, it, for a while, it, yeah. Exactly right. Whatever was kind of the new things, but back to- uh, Gerard, and just thinking about the ancient Greeks, right? So the ancient Greek excellence dominated the society of Greek nobles and others and produced a certain type of person, yeah, that yes. would, that was very different than say the UK, we're talking about the age of enlightenment after the founding of the Royal Society, whose motto, as you know, was nullius in verba, take no one's word. For. Yes, right. right. What do you think? What do I think? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Whoa, where do I... Well, I think he, he threw me another another softball. I want to get to go get to the <laughs> to the critiques of Gerard because those are a bit hard, more difficult to deal with. Well, as I said, I've been studying the intellectual history of innovation in my spare time ever since I got the invitation to lecture on it. And as I mentioned before, I think you can basically break up humanities. In intuitions of innovation into, I'd say, largely three periods. Muff, you know, it's all, when you try to break 3,000 years into three periods, it's all, it's getting muffy. But here it goes. All the way from, you know, Zero, Z Zena, who's the, one of the first, at least recorded, to use the Greek phrase, kainotomia, to, to kaino, I mean, new, and tomia, I think, means to cut. 
he was proposing a new way for people to do mines. So that was an innovation. It was a technical innovation. All the way to the Latin authors. And, and then you have the Reformation as well as the Republic period that form innovation in a way. And then you have our modern industrial period. So let me just give you a super brief overview. In this sort of, we'll call it the, in antiquity, the dominant view of innovation was that it was bad, that it probably shouldn't be done, probably unavoidable, right? This is why in Plato's Sipolis, his perfect aristocratic society, he still gives you a degeneration of states, right? Aristocracy degenerates into timocracy, or the rule of the honorable, the military men, degenerates into oligopoly, the rule of the rich, degenerates into, God forbid, democracy degenerates eventually into tyranny. You know, you, you find Aristotle warning against a similar thing. He had this idea that much like a spendthrift, innovation was something almost evil that, you know, snuggled in innocuously until your entire state has been changed. What's really funny is the Romans, or many of them, had a positive view of innovation. Is it novo? Novo? Innovo? Innovo? I think that's a Latin word. I'll have to go back to it. De, de, de novo. Right. Yeah, perhaps. And... What's really funny, however, is once you pull their understanding of innovation apart, it's actually a negative view because that word meant a return. It meant a rejuvenation, recovery. So when they were translating part of the Bible into Latin, what was translated into this, this sort of a phrase for innovation was, at, was things like God taking the chosen people back into the promised land, right? So it was introducing something new. But it was rescuing, it was a renaissance. It was rescuing something old and then rejuvenating society. With that. So as you can tell, they're still not really positive about this idea of innovation. And most of the innovation in this ant antiquity, period of antiquity, was political, social innovation, right? You have Xenophon and you know, technical innovations of improving minds and how to organize slaves to better open new minds. But most of it was political. So that's the first period. Now, I would categorize it as like, not many people are caring about innovation, but it's mostly bad. You probably shouldn't do it, you know, you know, for a break glass in case of emergency. And the second period of English, I'm um, sorry, Protestant Reformation, as we discussed already, gave innovation a really bad term. So it's almost as bad as calling someone an innovator. It was almost then, it was almost as bad as calling someone a racist today. And what made this even worse was the failed attempts at republicanism in England. And so innovation took upon what's added to this um, theological connotation of heresy from the Reformation and the Protestant and the Catholics accusing each other of innovation. There was added this additional political charge of a revolutionary, right? Revolution was also a bad word up until then. And then in our modern period, innovation, I think, began to become rehabilitated by Bentham, the utilitarians. Once you think about things in terms of utility, there's a natural idea of trying to maximize it which, you know, innovations are required to do that. Obviously, the French Revolution rehabilitated it as well. But in terms of this fundamental question of what I think about that, you know, why may this happen? I would say that, you know, innovation has undergone one of the biggest sort of flips from negative to positive over the past few centuries. And I would say it's probably because our fundamental conception of time has changed in some important way. Whereas, you know, even in the time of the Reformation, it was a dissent, right? It was focused on the Whereas now we're much more oriented to the future. And I think because of that, alongside other philosophical changes, as you can tell, I'm still working through this myself. I think that's why innovation took upon a positive word and why it was such a negative word in the basically much of antiquity, as well as even in dark ages, so to speak. So what about that, though? I mean, if we were to look at, you know, just as objectively as we could at the dark ages to pick up on that particular period of history. It seems to me that like, we're not going to find too much of anything good there. We're going to find stasis. We're going to find lack of any material progress. I seem to recall an economist, so probably wrong, my degree is in economics, saying that it took us until something like 1801 to regain the per capita income that was enjoyed by a Roman citizen in AD one. And let's just say that directionally that economist yeah, was correct. Yeah, yeah. And so by that measure, by just that one measure, and I agree that we could argue all day long about which is the right measure to use, but just on, on that one measure, we basically had net no progress 
in humanity for thousands of years. And yeah. like how I, for one, would be, I mean, I'm, I, as you know, usually look for things to root for as opposed to against, but right. I'm going to root against a thousand years of darkness. Yeah. Let me play devil's advocate here. Obviously, I'm in the 21st century and in the tech sector, so I, uh, so I can't disagree <laughs> with that too much. I don't know. There's something very odd about our concept of innovation progress. You know, this idea that everything has to be progressing you know, infinitely, that there's no end, that the goal of life is to progress. And you know, Tocqueville used to make fun of the Americans when he came over to visit. He said the Americans all wanted to you know, self-improve. You see this today. They always wanted to improve. But it's so minute improvements that they're making. It's so trivial. And they're all oriented to the future. They're not focused on the present. In fact, another book I'm reading right now is called The Invention of Improvement. And it's about how the word improvement came to be. It was invented in English. There was no direct counterpart in any of the continental European languages, I think, the first few centuries. And do you know where the concept came from, improvement? It came no. from the improvement of land. Like they're like, that makes like sense. getting a bit more crops from your plot of land, finding a way to juice up your rents. And then all the intuitions from this concept of improvement, this marginal, somewhat infinite increase, material, of course, when improvement became a politically charged word that people could rally around, this notion of improvement and progress started seeping into morality, politics, technology. But at the end of the day, you know, the jesting way to look at us is that we're all these minor petty bourgeoisie trying to improve our plot of land in the moral sphere, in the academic sphere, economic sphere. I mean, I don't know. Let me put it this way. The people that I think want progress the most or tend to, or a people who tend to really want progress are those whose, whose current lives are quite unsatisfactory. In some sense, this is Feuerbach's critique of Christianity, right? That the Christians project all of the good attributes of man into this wondrous beyond and as a result, rob themselves of it. And, you know, obviously it's hard for one to argue against progress, the material goods, but I think it injects a sort of a triviality into the world, right? To think about it, and I was this too, it's just like you're an economist. I don't feel bad about critiquing it. Think about all those people waiting for the new iPhone releases, right? And being so excited. Oh, there's a new camera spec bump, five megapixels to seven. This is going to change everything. And you watch these YouTube, you gain some distance to it. And you watch these YouTube, like tech review people. Oh my God, the new pods that changes everything. Like, you know, I think it, it misses a lot about life and what humans fundamentally are. This narrow focus on economic progress. So that, I mean, there's definitely trade-offs. That's one critique. Okay, that's the sort of ethical critique. I, I'd like to hear your response to it. But let me, let me throw you two, two, two fastballs at once. The other critique, and this is something we brought up last time, but I'm you know, really thinking about now that I'm thinking about innovation and how odd and unique our notion of innovation and openness to the new is in modernity. Which is, you, if you look at our track record in innovation, creating new things, I mean, it's not great. I mean, it's not terrible, of course, right? With TV, you and I are talking face to face, whereas we would have traveled by horse, I don't know, three hours to go to Connecticut or something like that. But we almost blew ourselves up, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis. It's hard not to see how we don't have a major nuclear catastrophe in 200, 300 years, right? If there's a major conflict somehow. You know, AI, as you know, the reason you're an investor in stability.ai, I listened to your podcast, I did my rabbit hole digging as well, is because you recognize the clear potential for massive apocalyptic danger here. You know, climate change is man-made. The amount of deaths in World War I and World War II, I don't see, you know, biotech will, will enable us to potentially create two or even multiple casts of men, you know, some enhanced genetics, some not. I don't know. I'm kind of I'm coming. I'm kind of coming to this sort of Greek view as, as perhaps best not to innovate until forced to do. But I'm playing the devil's advocate here because I, I want to hear your response. Boy, I don't even know where to begin. My grandfather was born in 1885, and when he was born, there were no cars. Everything was horse drawn. Now there were cars experimentally, but there were yeah cars everywhere. No Model T. They had no electricity. They had no antibiotics. So he, much like President Coolrich's son could have had it happened to him he was he to build himself up for college football he was a lumberjack cutting down trees in stillwater minnesota and president coolidge's son was a tennis player playing tennis on the lawn in of the white house right. and he got a sliver 
from his wood racket, and he died. He died from a sliver because we didn't have antibiotics. And so could my grandfather have died. And, you know, the list is rather endless from just the lifetime of my grandfather. Yeah, right? yeah. He was born in 1885. He died in 1973. What he saw, I would submit to you, was endless and mostly positive innovation. I, right. I personally don't know about you, but if I had access to a time machine, I don't know unless I could bring all sorts of my own antibiotics and soap and everything else, whether I would want to go into the past at all. I would view the past as being- Compared uh, to you as, and I, uh, where we're at right now, or the median? Because that's a very different question. I mean, the median person in, 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 on Earth right now is probably like a Foxconn worker, right? He was like alienated and- Well, to that, I would cite the Institute for Human Progress saying that over the last two decades, one billion right. people have- Stop yeah. dying of dysentery and have emerged from poverty. Yeah. And again, they go into making up that median. So it sounds, it's interesting to me because it does sound almost like a, a discussion. I wouldn't elevate it to argument. A discussion. Elevate away. I think arguments are productive, especially <laughs> when they're done in good, good company. They are, but you'll see in a minute why I don't elevate it. Yeah. It seems almost like we are having a conversation between optimism and pessimism. Yeah, right. I and, think that's right, yeah. And for me, I've always said, pessimists sound smart and optimists make money. Right. And yeah. but, but, but. Now, right. now, of course, my position is that of rational optimists, right? And I put rational in front of it to avoid yeah, the- yeah. Loss Naive of, optimists, yeah. Right, or Dr. Pangloss from Candide, right? This is the best of all right, best right, possible right, worlds. Right, right. right, I don't believe any of that at all. I believe that, as you just listed, there are serious problems that we face now, will face in the future. It's my yeah. expectation that the problems will become more serious, but that's only because we will have solved some of the less serious ones going forward. So problems are always with us, um, or yeah, our, perception, yeah, yeah. our perception is that problems are always with us. And so just on the basic stats, if we cover ourselves with a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, yeah. I would still much rather be born in 2022 or 2023 than I would have wished to have been born in 1822 or 1823. Yeah, yeah. I would say I would probably wish to be born as a, I would be okay being born as a peasant in medieval Europe post Black Plague because uh, there was a massive labor shortage and labor had incredible negotiation powers. I mean, you read the stories about these peasants post Black Plague and it's really incredible. They had like a like hundred days or something of festivals in some of these years. There was community there, there was religion there. I mean, I feel very, I'm very fortunate in my position in modernity. So I wouldn't change that. Now, would I trade it to become a aristocrat in, in, in Chinese antiquity? That's a more serious question, but I don't know. And by the way, I think you are right, by the way, about a conversation between a pessimist and an optimist. And, you know, if I may, if I may stab the sword deeper in myself, that perhaps you're <laughs> too kind to do. Uh, another way of saying that is that, and Jonathan, you, your anxiety is just freaking itself out. And it's latching onto something. And Sam Altman actually had a great tweet, I think, the other day where he said, you know, I think AI risk is just people who are paranoid, who would have been worried about witches in, in the 17th century. Now they were now they're worried about AI risk. And I think that's a fun, that's the fundamentally right view to view people that they're, that what is core to them, Girardian position as well, is a sort of certain dis disposition. And so their opinions almost, you know, Nietzsche had this great line, you know, or I'm going to paraphrase here. It's something like the book that an author writes is more of a confession of, about the author himself than it is about the subject matter. And I think that's fundamentally right. And I think I am a very paranoid. I wouldn't say pessimistic, but very quite, quite a paranoid person. And, you know, the other way to cut it, and maybe a more charitable way to cut it, is that the optimist makes the airplane, the pessimist makes the parachute. Yeah, but, let, but you know, before we jump into anything else, l let me ask you this. It seems like innovation is arming humanity with increasingly powerful means, right? Whether it's through biology, whether it's through weaponry, or it's through intelligence, c c computation. Where does your faith lay that we'll be able to stem, we'll be able to helm that power properly. Because, because 
I mean, most of antiquity's concern, or a lot of antiquity's concerns, is the inability for man to, for example, get access to truth, right? From the tree of good and evil, though shall not eat. Oedipus, right? He wanted to tempt fate. In some sense, I would say that, and Gerard, I think, would agree with me here, but he's also a pessimist. To say the least. To, to, to say uh, the, the least. The world will end soon, damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to say the least. What was going on with this, with this? You were asking me about yeah, my, my worries. Yeah, yeah. Where does uh, your... Oh, I, I remember. My, the last point I was going to make is I think modern man, I think, exaggerates his agency, his ability to control things. And, you know, may, maybe the Greek view is too pessimistic, right? No matter what Oedipus does or what Leontis, uh, no, what Leontis does, all going to be subject to, to fate. And sorry, Leontis, Shakespeare, what's Oedipus's name again? And anyways, Oedipus's father, whatever his father does, whatever Oedipus does, fate will always catch up to them. That's probably too pessimistic. But where, yeah, where, where does your, no, I'll turn it on you. Why are you so confident that we'll be able to steward these technologies properly? I think first off, you have to establish the nuance between being excited about them and being, and one's level of confidence that, that nothing will go wrong. I don't have a level of confidence that nothing will go wrong. In fact, yeah. I anticipate that much will go wrong. And it is only through better explanations and better understandings that right, we right, will right. be able to tackle some of these problems. The ancients, if you will, were completely unready to tackle any of these problems because they had not built the body of knowledge, the human colossus, so to speak, that we have been building, well, maybe since Gutenberg, since we were allowed to time bind our ideas and send them into the future. Right. So I think we talked about AI before. AI. I think it depends on which track you go down. If you go down right. the track where AI is closed, and you mentioned Jerry Bentham a bit ago, father of utilitarianism, and as you probably know, his stuffed body is on display at his former college in London. I did not know. Uh, wow, you, you can go visit it. He's not the best looking guy. He hasn't been well preserved, but he's got a uh, few years on him. Yeah, exactly. But he, Bentham, when I heard you mention him, I immediately thought he was a great example because utilitarianism, which he came up with, was originally thought to be a very kind philosophy right. in that many right. of the ideas advanced by it were done right. to make things better for humans right. yeah, because yeah. at the time they were horrible, yeah. right? And thus the panopticon was invented by Bento and... For those who don't know what a panopticon is, it's a single tower, the center of a circular prison. And into this tower, you cannot see the prisoners. All of the prisoners don't face out. They don't see the landscape. They look in and all they right. see is the panopticon. And under Bentham, he thought that this was an act of generosity and kindness to the prisoners so that they would not be housed in the squalor and depravity of the British prisons of the time, right? right? This was going to be progress. This was going to be innovation that helped these poor souls who were locked up for a variety of reasons. Well, that, you know, that, it, that first principle was in good faith on Bentham's part. But then when we got to the secondary and tertiary effects of a panopticon, became not a wonderful thing at all. It became quite a, an object terror. Of, or, of terror, right? Because it, as we learned about human psychology, we learned that one of the worst things for a human is this idea that they can never relax and just be themselves, if only for a second. And the panopticon, because they don't know who's watching and when, they default to the idea that they're always being watched, they're always being controlled, and all of their agency is taken from them by a pan yeah. panopticon, right? So if we go the closed route, we have a very few in a panopticon making decisions for the very many. And I think that's a very bad outcome, which wow. is one of the reasons why I invested in and am chairman of Stability AI because it is open source. But there are still problems there. 
right? It's uh, not yeah. there is no panacea that's yeah, going yeah. to solve all of our problems. But open source, why is that better? Well, because if you know anything about the ability of minds to work well together, one of the things you really want to add to the mix is cognitive diversity. It is very presumptuous and quite haughty, in my opinion, for me to presume that I am going to be able to know what every good idea is going to be. It's absurd on the face of it. When you open things up like we did on August 22nd, when we released our entire model with weights, we had a Cambrian-like explosion of innovation and creativity. So on that particular question, I think that the tools that AI makes possible, for example, yeah. the ability to further interrogate liminal spaces where human minds can't go, I think we are going to find an enormous amount of information there. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing for my discussion with you, I had the thought, boy, it'll be interesting to see what AI makes of Gerard. Uh, uh, yeah. I one, tried. Uh, GBT3 isn't good at uh, him yet. Thank uh, God for uh, me. Thank uh, God for me. Uh, well, <laughs> may, maybe our stable diffusion model. <laughs> there you go. Well. Maybe you'll get me. It's coming for everything <laughs> I hold most dear. But the point is that, like, I, I remain optimistic because yeah. we continue to go further. And our understandings continue to be better and better. Are they often and sometimes completely wrong and misguided? Of course. That, that is part and parcel of what it means to be a member of yeah, human yeah, yeah. society. So rather than vote for stasis and status quo yeah. and withdrawal, yeah. withdrawal, I go the other way. Yeah. I go yeah. for movement. Life is movement. Life is not stasis. It is not standing still. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose a good analogy here would be something like we're beginner skiers and we're on a double, double black run. That and actually happened the, to me. That actually happened to me as a beginner. And the, skier. And the, the as the, the stasis guy just wants to pizza down as, you know, as slow as possible or like, you know, like, like edge his way down as slow, as slow as possible. Whereas the accelerationist just says, you know, you know, you know, screw it. You know, let's just give this a try and see how it goes. I mean, the one thing I'll say, and let's, let's all turn this argument or discussion, I don't care too much what we call it. I'm quite enjoying this, it, it, bring into a nice synthesis is that, you know, as I've told our listeners, I, I'm in tech as well. I'm very interested. I was actually somewhat trained in C AI and CS specifically at, at Columbia. I'm very interested in these things as well. And in some sense, I don't think we have an option to pizza down the hill, so to speak. Like the cat's out of the bag and the only way out is through. So even if, and I'm not even sure I hold this position, but I think I'm certainly much more sympathetic to this position than you are. A lot of this episode, I was playing devil's advocate to, to really tease out your views because I was so interested. Even if I did believe that it was good, and let's say before, around the Reformation, put the cat in the box, right? And to not progress further. That doesn't change the fact that the cat is already jumping out of the box and there's no way to get it back in. There, there's no way to stop the unending advance of science. If you stop it in one nation, another nation will take the baton and that nation will become more powerful, more dominant. So unless you plan on nuking the world yourself and bring, bring the apocalypse or Ted Kaczynski and everyone, and even that didn't work, there's really no way to, to put the cat in the box. So unfortunately, I think that we got to go down the hill. We got to go down the double black run, guns blazing. And I, But I think the difference is that even though we're both going down the hill, so to speak, you do it with joy, screams of cheering, whereas I do it with fear and trembling. <laughs> but we're both going down the hill, regardless. We're both going down this rabbit hole. That is an excellent. That is an uh, excellent way to summarize it, because that's true. And I have found that you know, Alan Watts says that worry is an endlessly peeled onion. That you know, well, uh, people who are given to worry and paranoia are. Essentially, you mentioned it earlier, actually, they'll just find something new to worry about. Yeah. If, if the other goes away, they'll find a new yeah, thing yeah. But focused I do to worry say, about. I do want to say that I think it, it can be quite productive. In fact, some of my friends who are AI researchers, and you talk to them, and they all have this sense that you really need to be cautious. And I think a heightened degree of paranoia there isn't the worst thing. In fact, I, am, I often oscillate between what it really takes to build a really great startup, whether it's 
delusional optimism, right? The <laughs> sort of Gerard, sorry, the sort of Jobsian delu reality distortion field, or it's paralyzing paranoia. And I think I've come to the conclusion is that it has to be both at the same time. I actually agree with you about that. I think that to try to continue the discussion about AI, to try to be, again, Panglossian about it, is a fool's errand because there are easy to identify problems that we already know about, right? For example, the fakes yeah. uh, and what they can do to the credibility of any number of people who could be destroyed by a right, fake right. video of them saying something that is anathema to the way they actually think about things. Yeah. So my answer for all of that is there's a quote, I can't remember who said it, but I love it. It's like, so we discovered fire and good for humanity. It gave us bigger brains because we were able to cook our meat. It warmed our hearts. It did all these incredible things. But it was also one of the most destructive powers on Earth at that time. And so what did we do? We didn't ban fire. We had Fire departments, fire warnings, fire extinguishers, fire mm. e exits. And so speaking of deep fakes, staying on that theme for a moment, one of the things we're doing is we are funding a contest. Stability AI is putting up a $100,000 bounty. And O'Shaughnessy Ventures, because I believe in this so deeply, is adding another 100000 So it will be a $200,000 prize for a competition to see who can write code that comes up with the best deep face fake detection. Yeah. Now, I have no illusions about this. This will be a continual war. And, you know, that's how we got deep fakes in the first place, the adversarial nature of the two right. programs working against each other. But my point is, if it reaches a hurdle rate for now, right? So for 2023, if there's a hurdle rate, and let's say it's identifying 90%, just to pick a number, of deep fakes, we're not only going to, obviously, we're going to pay the 200000 to the coder who, who gave us this code, right. but we are also going to distribute it for free. It will be available on everyone's iPhone, everyone's Google phone. Every download site in the world is going to have this software so that everyone can have it for free. And then we're going to continue to iterate. Then we are going to continue to try to make it better because yeah. our adversaries are going to make the adversarial model better too. Right. right. So, and then another aspect of it is the whole idea of, it seems to me that people are afraid of the wrong thing. I think mm -hmm. that people, I think that people are afraid of generalized artificial intelligence or that which is sentient. Right. So Terminator style. I would argue that we still don't understand the nature of qualia, which is a deeply needed thing in trying to explain consciousness. Right. Like after right 3,000 years, we made very little progress. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I have many neuroscientists who are friends and I ask them about this and talk about pessimistic. They all are like, oh, my God, we don't even like we have no idea about quality. And for those who don't know what quality is, the best example that I've found is the Pixar movie Ratatouille, where the normally quite dour critic comes into the restaurant where the rats are the chefs. Right. And they make him some ratatouille. And it's in the scene where he takes his first bite of the ratatouille. Because what the animators at Pixar do so brilliant it, to, to illustrate qualia is they send him right back to his child. And he's right, a little right, boy right. coming in. His mother hugs him. He feels safe. He's coming from the cold. He comes into the warm house. His mother embraces him. And she gives him the ratatouille. And all is right with the world, right? So what does that mean? It's at some external stimulus evokes all of these feelings in us at once. You've seen the idea of smell. When you smell a certain thing, you're immediately transported back to when you were seven playing in the cedar closet and shouldn't have been and 
et cetera. But the point is, if we can't, first off, define qualia, we can't program qualia. And it seems to me, again, very possible that I'm wrong. But it seems to me that qualia is a very, it's not only nice to have, mm -hmm. it's neat to have if mm -hmm. you want to program artificial intelligence that can become sentient. So I think that's what most people are afraid of. They're afraid of James Cameron's version of AI, right, which right. is Arnold's Terminator, I'll be back. And like, I love the movie. Got to give Doff the cap to the guy. He did a great job, but he did it, in my opinion, huge disservice right. to to the telling, like Black Mirror. We started a competition at Infinite Loops, this wonderful podcast that we're on right now, that we called White Mirror. So many of the scientific right, right. fiction stories of the past, of the recent past, this is important because Jules Verne, who was like the, uh, you know, he was science fiction. He was not negative at all in most respects. It became a symptom of a more modern age, which was quite pessimistic and in which we saw dystopias, not utopias. My point being, though, that we collectively create the world. And by that, by we, I mean, all sentient beings on this planet currently numbering 8 billion that I know of. Maybe there are some lurkers from other places in the galaxy. I don't know. But that all sentient creatures believe, and that creates your Bates reality, that creates your ground state reality, right? Yeah. And so we're inventing this as we go along. I just think that people are afraid of something that isn't what AI really is. My friend, Jeremiah Lowen, and then I'll let you respond. My friend, yeah. Jeremiah Lowen, who is a technologist, said in a recent episode that I did with him, he goes, and folks, on artificial intelligence, let me just say this. It's not artificial. It's not intelligence. It's an algorithm. Get over it. That's a good one. It's like, uh, I forget who says it. The Holy Roman Empire is neither holy well, it's, Roman. Yeah, nor an empire. I will say, um, you remind me a lot of your optimism, at least, of a gentleman by the name of Joe Lonsdale, kind of Palantir, who I've been building a company with the last two years. And he has this podcast called American Optimist. And in part, it's battling against this sort of, you know, pessimistic anti-tech sentiments that I've been channeling, I suppose, in this episode to play devil's advocate. I was going to say, okay, this is what I was, I'll tell you what I was going to say, but I thought, then I thought something new. I was going to say, I think you and Joe's this sort of optimism perhaps is the only way to proceed forward. That, that is to say, if everyone is as pessimistic as Gerard, we're doomed to fail. But if, agree, if, agree. If, if someone, even if their agency is misguided, their exaggerated sense of their own agency is misguided, it still does not preclude the possibility of failure. But at least there is a possibility of success if there's people like yourself who are actively trying to you know, direct the, these forces. And maybe, you know, one, one of my favorite lines from uh, Teal Zero to One is, you're not a lottery ticket, right? Like you, you're not a mere leaf blown in the wind, right? This is the Greek view in some sense, right? And that wind would be fate. Yeah. So you definitely give me a lot to think about. Now, I was going to say that as a concession, yeah. but then I thought of another perhaps less charitable. And again, I'm being very playful here, really, solution, which is maybe we can ban innovation, or at least certain types of innovation. What I call to mind is, I believe, and I just read like one paragraph on this, so I'm going to have to read some more, that in the 1960s, you know, we stopped, we agreed unilaterally to stop biochemical weaponry research across the world. I actually don't know if that's true. I'd be surprised if we actually stopped. But if such a thing were to be possible, maybe there's another thing, right? Like, for example, fission. Or something like that. We just say, okay, like fusion. Is it fusion or fission that we've solved? The new well, we fusion. want what we want is fission. Right, right. Okay, so we have fusion. Maybe we say, you know, fusion. That's given us enough trouble already. Maybe let's just unilaterally agree not to explore fission. Again, I'm not championing that that mentality, but I am saying if one does believe that we are able to stop explorations in certain technological areas, perhaps for certain areas, and I think most people agree that bioweaponry research is a good place to stop. It does make sense to put things out of bounds. Now, I don't know if we can actually do that. And I don't know if we actually stop them. I'd be very surprised if we actually unilaterally you know, stop bioweaponry research. But uh, 
those are my yeah. thoughts. So I appreciate and agree with your first thought. I figured you would, which is why it's a concession. <laughs> On the second thought, that's falling right into the David Deutsch trap of assuming that you know with certainty right. uh, that whatever you want to go out and ban is something right, that right. it will do a true good by banning it. Right, um, right. Not to even bring up your observation, which I think is correct, where we say that it was banned, but come on, you'd have to be a pretty small child and still believe in a certain someone coming down the chimney to right, understand right. or to truly believe that was banned because come on. Or you yeah. unilaterally renounced. Right? You, yeah, more, unilaterally. Nah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Point, nudge, say no more. But it also made me think about the idea of the inability to prophesize to, let me give you an example, a historical example. Under the rubric of we're going to ban something which everyone agrees, that's a loaded phrase. And, right. And Can I say one thing here? I, I promise I'll, I'll let you finish your story. I, I think in ancient Judeo law, there's actually a very interesting term, and Gerard brings this up, where if everyone agrees that a uh, uh, someone is guilty, they're let loose. They're let loose, yes, because I know. Because they must be, they're, they're like, there's something must have gone wrong. And I think the Girardian interpretation here is if everyone, not just like agreements, like, you know, two plus two equals four, but like fervent agreement, like that is a witch over there. We're all going to die in 200 years. If everyone right. agrees like that, I think the Girardian intuition is that there's so much social force to believe, we should genuinely ask whether there's something real that belief is pointed towards. Does that makes sense, I, right? Yeah, it does. So, I and I know all about that, and I applaud it. I think it was actually something that we could have used for useful, very useful yeah. from our past, yeah, and from our past traditions. But anyways, I uh, interrupted you. Please, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. It's along the lines of the everyone thinks, right? So I'm generally get triggered whenever anyone says something like "everyone thinks" to me, because I will immediately say. I don't even know what topic they're talking about. And I might say, well, I don't. But I think of the story of Semmelweis, who was a doctor in the 1800s in Vienna. And he was assigned to the woman's pregnancy hospital. And he got this idea that the women, he noticed that the women who were attended by male surgeons as opposed to female midwives were dying at vastly higher rates than the right, women. Right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was a nasty person, I believe, as well. But that, well, that, that's let's, part of the... Let's, that's, yeah, <laughs> let, let's keep his personality out of it, okay? Right. So let's keep it on his... I'll hold back my uh, hominin. Yeah. It, 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 let's keep it on his intuition, which was born from observation. So he noticed that the one thing that distinguished other than their sex between the male doctor and the female midwife was at the time, it was seen as very unmanly to wash your hands or clean your hands. So right. very often, a male doctor would go from dissecting a cadaver to giving birth with all of those. They didn't know they were germs because germ theory was also rejected by medicine. Boy, if you really want to get depressed, look at what medicine knew when it knew it right. and then when it adopted it, right. it's tragic. Anyway, right. so he said, I think it's the dirty hands. I want you all to wash your hands in this combination of lye and he had some other things in there. And all the men are like, outraged. What, do you want us to be like women? And no, we're not going to do that. It, and it, besides, you're wrong, Semmelweis. It's the priest ringing the death bell when one of the mothers dies, that influences the uh, a very mimetic influence on the a uh, very right. deadly mimetic influence on the other women. So Semmelweis says, okay, that's an interesting observation. So what does Semmelweis do? He has the priest stop ringing the death bell. And guess what? Deaths don't change at all. And so he's like, wasn't the bell. You're washing your fucking hands. And they all did in protest. And you know what happened. The death rate of the women attended by the male physicians drastically declined because they weren't infecting them anymore. The sad part of this story, though, is because of 
everyone knowing that it was effeminate for men to wash their hands, the social desire to ban or to mitigate what this lunatic Semmelweis wanted was right. so strong that when you mentioned that he was a disagreeable type, yes, he was, and it got him into trouble politically, and he was removed from his position. And his successor came in, saw this, and he goes, what is all this hand-washing thing? And stopped it. Now, here's my point. Everybody knew that was the way things were, right? So, like, banning men washing their hands would have gone over huge back in Semmelweis's Vienna. Bad outcome. Really bad outcome. Because it stopped learning. It stopped progress. It stopped new information. And his successor, I would forgive, save one thing. Semmelweis kept very detailed records of the death rate and number of deaths pre his intervention and post his intervention. His successor was so bound up in his societal beliefs, one would almost put them in a mimetic category, right. uh, that he refused the empirical information before his very eyes and banned the hand washing for reasons that had nothing to do with factual information. What happened? Women went back to dying at accelerated rates. All those lost lives. So I'm not a big fan of banning. And, and, and more, more importantly, you think if it can't be banned, right? Right. Like, right, right. So I guess that, that leaves me back to screaming down the hill, fear and trembling. <laughs> I'm back to my, my, my point of concession. Because, <laughs> right, if you can't stop this, the only, the only way out is through. I mean, that is the position I'm in right now, right? That's why I'm in tech. But uh, I, that's, that's why I am interested in, in, in AI and, you know, reading Bostrom and trying to figure Nick out Bostrom how this thing is going to... Yeah. Totally like him. Love him, actually. And I'm looking at the time, my God, I could, you and I could talk to each other for hours. Well, Jonathan, I always have a wonderful time chatting with you because you provide a series of thoughts and a framework, which I love to see and yet moving things forward. So we will no doubt do this again. Um, but as I asked you after our first visit, in the infinite loops, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to let you double down. We're going to give you, we're giving you a magic microphone and you get to speak in it. You can't say anything bad, <laughs> but what you can do is you can say two statements that will incept all 8 billion people on this planet. And when they wake up the next morning, they're going to think I've just had the most wonderful idea or ideas. And I'm going to do X. You get two. What two X's are you giving us? I'm going to do one. I've actually been thinking about this because I figured you, you'd ask me this question. But to preface this, you know, the last time I told you that I was going to pump some kind of shit coin because I fundamentally <laughs> don't have the moral either confidence or arrogance to know yet. I'm still quite young and figuring stuff out clearly of what is good for everyone and what, what people should believe in. But this time, I think, I have a pretty good idea. It's still not, you know, world changing, but I would say, you know, in antiquity, it was the small phallus that was considered desirable because it symbolized the virtue of moderation. Bless. <laughs> <laughs> a a reevaluation of values, baby. And with that, we're out. <laughs> so are you going to buy a Porsche next or what's going on? <laughs> Listen, this was so much fun. Great to yeah. see you. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Thank you so much.